Um, thanks for joining us today for Food for Thought, Food Riddles, and Riddling Ways. The exhibition is currently on in the McLennan Library Building lobby. And today we're going to have a conversation with the curators who put together the exhibition. For those of you local to Montreal, we invite you to stop in for a visit to see the exhibition for yourself. It's open to the vaccinated public. You can browse through the history of food riddles and much more in the cases in the lobby. Today, you'll get a peek behind the scenes as the curators, myself included, talk about the exhibition and their favorite items in the cases. And before we do that, I'm gonna just mention some housekeeping things. If you do need help with anything, joining the meeting or subtitles or any of those things, you can send a note in the chat to myself or my colleague Labiba, who's helping out today behind the scenes. Um, you can also send questions or comments for the curators in the chat throughout the event. We will have a Q&A at the end, so you can put your questions in the chat and we will talk about those towards the end of the event. Um, we do have, ha or sorry, we have had some really great conversations and engagements in the chat at our virtual events, and we hope to hear um, more of that today. So we're, we welcome your opinions and comments and possible solutions to the riddles that you see on screen. Um, one other note is if you're comfortable, you can turn on your video. Uh, we do like to see who we're talking to, but that is entirely up to you. If you're comfortable turning it on, feel free to do so. This event is has been certified virtual sustainable uh, by the McGill Office of Sustainability. So that means that we have taken extra steps to try and create as sustainable an event as possible, meaning limiting our print publications and PR about the event, choosing our content carefully, and sometimes even delivering in a virtual format. Um, and then note, that's the end of the housekeeping. One other important thing is that myself and some of the other panelists and curators today are joining you from McGill's downtown campus. And McGill University is located on land that has long served as a site of meaning and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Roar and McGill honors, respects, and recognizes these nations as traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which I and my colleagues who are here on campus are meeting with all of you today. So, on that note, I'm going to show one more slide. We'll give you a sneak peek of what the order of events that are coming up. So I'm going to pass the microphone shortly here to Christopher Lyons, the head librarian of Rare Books and Special Collections, to get us started. Then we'll hear from Natalie Cook, Kristen Howard, and Octavian Soft. And today's speakers include it's a it's a range of people, myself included, who helped curate the events. Natalie Cook is the associate dean of Roar and a professor of English here at McGill, and she was one of the lead the lead researcher on a number of projects that led up to this exhibition. We'll hear too from Kristen Howard, research assistant, current information studies student with a doctorate in history who helped curate the exhibition. We'll also hear from Octavian Soft, a documentation technician here at Roar, uh, who works with rare books and special collections and his work on Roar exhibitions is invaluable and his contributions to this one were very much appreciated. So now, one more thing to mention. Our series of events are free and open to everyone because of the support of donors. We're able to continue to offer free, event, free events. So we welcome gifts in support of the library's ongoing activities and outreach activities in particular. Today, special thanks go out to private donors Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley, whose gift allowed us to apply for matching funds from the government from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And those funds support our ongoing event series. Our library spaces are soon going to be reimagined in the Fiat Lux project, which means let there be light. And that building redesign is a major project to better meet the needs of the 21st century library user. This building and the complex here will be redesigned, renewed, and literally made new to open up room and spaces for discoveries and research. Your support is needed to help that project happen. We'll send out some links if you wanna find out more about that project and, and offer your support. We do appreciate all of that. So thanks to Labiba behind the scenes working to help make sure things flow smoothly. And now I'll pass the microphone to you, Chris. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen first and you can take it away. Great, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to be here and speaking to you. And I want to do something uh, which I don't usually do. And it's a share a bit of a behind the scenes look at my life. Don't worry, it's not gonna be any inappropriate sharing. It's my professional life. 
Um, and it's my element, which I enjoy a great deal, and that's collection development. Now, my um, situation is interesting. I would describe myself as a bibliophile, if not a bibliomaniac. So the fact that I'm paid to buy rare books and to do it with someone else's money is like a drunk getting a job in a distillery. Anyway, I'm really happy. Now, the science, this is the behind the scenes, the science and art behind this are such that there are different ways we build collections. There are different sources where there are rare book catalogs and there are several around my office right now. We go to antiquarian book fairs. Uh, there are websites of dealers or like um, collective uh, websites for things. And then there are offers that are given to us. Um, we make connections with antiquarian book dealers so that they quote us things we want. That's the sort of goal. There are donations. Wonderful people are always offering us interesting things, including the last time we went to um, we the last um, uh, event we had, where where actually a couple people wrote us afterwards saying, "Oh, you collect this? We have this. Would you be interested?" Which was really kind. And the other one is through third parties. Okay, here's my riddle: When are rare book dealers like Ronald McDonald? Rare book dealers, when are they like Ronald McDonald? Uh-huh, give up. Okay, it's when they push things on people to get them to needle us to buy them. So the key to McDonald's was Ray Kroc figured out who makes decisions about where families go out to eat, the three-year-old. So what is he, a pitch to the three-year-old. So that big clown and Mary McCheese and all those other dudes aren't to get you interested, it's to get your kids interested so that they hound you to go to McDonald's. Rare book dealers are no better. What they do is they go to profs or other people and say, why don't uh, you get that? So here's an example of this happened in a prof of ours had gotten um, a notice from someone or had seen a notice from an antiquarian book dealer about this collection. And this person came to me with it. So what it was, it was a collection of 12 manuscript recipe books containing 1,300 culinary and medical manuscripts, and then some loose, a couple of hundred loose ones. And they were dated, they were from South Yorkshire from about 1790 to 1840. And most were from the Doncaster area, centered on Hooton Pagnell Hall. I know, Hooton Pagnell Hall. Sounds like a P.G. Woodhouse novel. You know, Bertie Woster opens up a telegram and explains, I say, Jeeves, Aunt Agatha has invited us to spend the weekend with her at Hooton Pagnell Hall. Anyway, despite the ridiculous name, it was a good acquisition. So it ticked a number of boxes for us in terms of a good collection, in terms of different ways it could be used from, oh my God, someone's watching from, from Yorkshire. That's wonderful. And if you're a P.G. Woodhouse fan from Yorkshire, I want to hang out with you. Anyway, I love Yorkshire. So I don't know if um, you are fans of the CBC radio show Under the Influence with Terry O'Reilly. It, it's a one that talks about advertising. The last couple of weeks, they've been doing one on don't do it advertising, sort of how advertising uses reverse psychology to get you interested in something. The famous one being don't squeeze the Charmaine, you know, don't stop squeezing this toilet paper in the store because it's so nice and soft. So this guy running around, Mr. Higgins or something like that, uh, you know, stopping these people with their sick obsession with toilet paper. Um, the one that comes to mind in my business is the old Maytag repair one. I don't know if you remember these ads, but they're quite ingenious in their way. It was this lonely Maytag repairman and he's you know, has no business. He's lonely, he's sad in his store because why Maytag? Appliances are so well built, no one needs to have them repaired. So the catchphrase is, not all Maytag repairmen are this lonely, but we're trying, which I always thought is, what a sick company. Like they're trying to drive these guys bankrupt, depressed, probably alcoholism. It's, it was awful, but somehow they thought it worked. Anyway, like the Maytag repairmen, rare book librarians don't want to be lonely. We don't. We want people to use our collections. So like I said, when we had this offer, I got really excited because I said this can do a number of different things. You know, history of medicine for the medicinal recipes, history of food and cooking. Uh, most of them were in women's hands and how information is collated, shared, et cetera, et cetera. So what do I do? It was not cheap. So I spoke to my boss. Uh, my boss being is Professor Natalie Cook, who's Associate Dean of Rohr, and amongst other things, 
is, is responsible for really publicizing our collective collections. And she saw opportunity here in these, not only for other people, but also for herself. And that was the genesis of the exhibition. So we got the collection and then it turned into much, much more. And at this point, I will turn the microphone over to her to continue the story. Thanks so much, Chris. So I have three objectives in just a few minutes. And the first is actually to introduce to you to the characters behind the scenes. And so I'm thrilled today that you get a glimpse of some of the co-curators of this exhibit. Unfortunately, you're not seeing another nine research assistants who helped me with the various um, elements of the exhibition, including the digital exhibition. But it's, um, it's given students a wonderful chance to work with primary materials and to really um, tease out the kinds of things you can learn from historical materials. So my favorite item is actually a book from this Doncaster collection, which we were told by the antiquarian bookseller came from a kitchen drawer, essentially. Um, and we looked at, there it is on the very left. It's a very modest looking manuscript book. And what we found when we looked at it closely, thanks for freezing that for a bit, Jacqueline, was that uh, it looked as though it was a table setting from a book by Mrs. Beaton let's say. But then um, I had a, a colleague come and speak and I, I was very excited and I showed her the book. And she said, look really carefully, these aren't actually food items that are drawn on the table, they're riddles. So at the top there, you can see the interior of a sportsman. And the answer to that is actually port because the word port is hidden in sportsman. It's one of the many riddles. So this is where we started the project and we went down the rabbit hole and said, what are these things? Can you guess what crooked Sarah is? It's sal awry, celery. Um, and so that we found a no number of other enigmatical bills of fare as they're called, or what we came to call as e -boffs. And these were puzzling meals where the dinner guests were treated to food for thought as well as food on their plates. Now this particular first exhibition case shows you a variety of different food related riddling practices. And I'll go through three of them in detail. But let me just start by saying, um, the second objective is to introduce you to some of these rather niche, very little known food, food riddling practices. And the third is to debunk the Established Knowledge, which is in this wonderful book by Eve Marlowe, which I highly recommend. But it's one of the only published sources that mentions an eboff, and it cites a 1755 Christmas menu of the then George II, and says that that was the origin of this practice of, of enigmatical bills of fare. And we've subsequently proved that wrong by going down the rabbit hole with this research project. So we found, of course, that riddling food practices originated much earlier. We can trace them back to China between the third and the sixth century. We can also see um, a, a Christmas practice or a pre-Christmas Saturnalia practice when Symphosius wrote out 100 Latin riddles somewhere between 284 and 700 AD. So we see that even in those early days, it was a fascination with scripting conversation over meals, which is something that riddles do. It helps ease awkward conversation, if you think about it. It allows um, people of different abilities and different ages to engage over a particular subject. And the, the more one engages over the subjects, the more one develops familiarity. The earliest eboff that we have found, or enigmatic bill affair, is actually from 1733 a good 20 years prior to George II's Christmas banquet. And the other thing that's interesting is a number of the dishes, which keep getting repeated, um, tell us that quite often it was members of the elite or the upper class who were participating in these events. The real giveaway is something called sorrowful apples. Uh, again, sorrowful apples. Those are pine apples, which would have been very, very expensive at the time. And in fact, a number of 
um, houses would would rent or borrow the pineapple to display it um, just to show that kind of opulence. Speaking of renting, this is another kind of um, visual satire. This is actually a menu and it's done with visual satires. And so you see on the top there, do you see Cod's head and shoulders? A rather um, uh, unfortunate image of a woman, um, but that would give you a chance to order that particular dish by choosing these particular satires. These ones are by William Heath, who is a very well-known satirist. And we have a book by William Heath, um, which, is, which is colorful and entertaining and hilarious in a, um, uh, in a way that I think uh, um, contemporary satirists might be uncomfortable with. Um, and those books were very expensive, so they were actually rented out. So that if you had a dinner party, you could rent the book and bring it to your table and then share it with your guests as a kind of entertainment. So e-boffs were essentially something that happened in England. Their heyday was between 1780 and about 1820. And then something interesting happened. We started to look and see what happens in other countries. And suddenly they crossed the Atlantic. And when they came to America, they came to be known as something called conundrum socials or conundrum events. And in America, they were ultimately fundraising events quite often by churches. Um, and it was a way of entertaining um, communities and to come out and earn a little bit of pin money. Um, so quite often what would happen is the poor unsuspecting guests would pay their money, come to the event, and then have to order from the conundrum menu. And then um, the amusement was obviously when they, they, they didn't guess correctly and they ended up with something that they really didn't want on their plate. Um, but those conundrum events could be themed. They, they, they were in public places like hotels. Sometimes they were on railway car cars. And the heyday of conundrum events was between about 1890 and 1920. By 1920, as the depression was coming and World War I was coming, these, these slightly frivolous conundrum events, including the e-boffs died out. Although in Canada, we actually maintained them. Our heyday was between 1893 and 1936. So we clung on to them even into the interwar period. And we can find examples in many different parts of Canada. Now I suspect you're thinking, but this is all to do with historical events. Nothing like this happens today. And it's not true. We have versions of riddling and puzzling dinner practices today. Think of speakeasies where you have to actually have an answer the riddle so as to get into it. Um, in Toronto, that would be Suite 114, for example, or the Mad Hatter in Oxford. There are also secret menus, as um, uh, one of our next speakers has told us, Kristen at the top has a new puppy, and she talks about the puppuccino at, at Starbucks, which is a free item on the menu, just for dogs. Um, there's also an anonymous bar in Prague, which is probably the most famous for having a secret menu. Um, and one of the most interesting riddling practices happened during COVID lockdown. One of the most famous restaurants in the world, Alinea in Chicago, decided to celebrate its 15th anniversary by teaming up with, with a, a game company. And they created very difficult pop-up riddles during the month of May, 2020 so as to give their guests food for thought and also keep that kind of relationship with the food establishment going at a time when their restaurant wasn't open. The last, which we give you examples of, and this goes back to Chris, who, um, who went out in search of some, some puzzling plates, was a 19th century French phenomenon. You saw those plates there. They're called assiettes parlantes. And they actually have a puzzle or a rebus on the front of the plate. And then when you turn the plate over, which we've done for you in the ex exhibit, you get the answer on the back. But it reverses the, uh, the role of the conundrum supper. With the conundrum supper, the poor diner has to guess what he's going to eat first and then wait to see and hope that it's the right thing. With, with the assiette parlante, they have to finish their plate to the the last crumb before they can actually turn the whole thing over and get the answer. But it's all about having um, something to do 
so that adults can play with their food, food as well as children playing with their food. And that's, that's the first case. And then I promised one Yorkshire person, a little spoiler alert here. Um, when we were looking at the Doncaster books, I was trying to trace who lived in that particular mansion, the Hootenpagan Hall. And I found that there were 11 families who lived in Doncaster, Yorkshire. And I found the names of those 11 families. And one of my surprises came when I realized it was my own. Now, over to the next speaker. I think Octavian, I think that's you. Octavian showed us, actually knew how to put an, an exhibition together. And he showed us how to put things in the, in the cases in a way that made them pop. Thank you very much, Natalie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, rather, and welcome to our uh, event. My name is Octavian Sab, and I work as a senior documentation technician at uh, the Rare Books and Special Collections Department of McGill University Library. Um, I would also like to say how fortunate I am to, to be here and to have such uh, amazing supervisors and colleagues. Um, you may start the video, Jacqueline, thank you. So the object I would like to present to you, which is also <clears throat> my favorite item in the exhibition, is called the Magic Mirror. I will present it in more detail shortly, but it is essentially a fun artifact which has at its base the principle of optics and uh, anamorphic imagery. Um, the, the wonderful object is not only the, it's not the only instance where we as exhibition curators have played with optics. Half of the job is selecting the items we wish to showcase, while the other half is displaying them. The latter half comes with its own challenges, and I would like to delve into the challenges of actually installing an exhibition. The idea of an exhibition is to look attractive, to feel vivid and interesting, and essentially to not feel flat or boring. This is where we use our own magic, and we employ the use of special supports to give dimension to the treasures we, showed to, we chose to showcase. For example, we wish to display our books open to a specific page, but their spines were either too fragile or could not op be open to too much. So we used plastic wedges or supports to keep the book open to a certain angle to not force the spine. We had to tie a strip of mylar, which is a special transparent and sturdy plastic film around the open pages to prevent them from curling. Sometimes we would have liked to uh, show multiple pages from a book and it's, uh, it's difficult to choose, but the only possible way to do so was to scan the desired pages, print them on foam core, and display them next to the book. We were not deterred by the limitations, but instead we have overcome them by collaborating with other library departments, especially the digitization lab, in order to provide the best possible experience to our viewers and to show as many fun and interesting items as possible. As you see in the video uh, at this moment, some limitations in installing the exhibition came from the way the cases are made. We could only open the side doors of the case and not the top, meaning we had to bend our knees and hold our arms straight in order to place the objects inside through a rather narrow space. It is an awkward procedure at first and it gets difficult when, uh, when you're attempting to insert larger items, but we did it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jacqueline. So what we have in front of us is a beautiful artifact called the Magic Mirror or Wonderful Transformations. This toy was apparently the first commercially produced anamorphic game in the United States issued by the important New York based children's book publisher McLaughlin Brothers. The company worked with many important artists and illustrators of the period, but the bulk of the present images are adapted from a slightly earlier French game titled Les Anamorphoses and published around 1860 in Paris by Walter Frere with designs by Arnaud Louis Tellery. So um, the contents of the magic mirror are housed in the publisher's original wooden box with a pictorial chromolithograph paper label mounted onto the removable sliding lid. The object is an anamorphic optical toy and it includes 24 lithograph plates, all hand colored, which were originally accompanied by a glass tube viewer. So please note uh, the amazing exquisite uh, state in which the, the box is after, after all this time. Uh, the previous owner must have taken a good care of it. So what is an anamorphic object? Anamorphosis as a technique requires the viewer to occupy a specific vantage point or use certain devices to discern a recognizable image from a distorted one. 
there are two types of anamorphisms. Our magic mirror falls into the catoptric type, meaning the viewer must use a light reflecting object, such as mirrors, um, such as mirrors or lenses, actually, to properly see an image. You can see the image from a var variety of angles and are not limited to only a single perspective. Images uh, included uh, include Emperor Louis Napoleon, Empress Eugenie, Sancho Panza on his donkey, and so on. Anamorphic imagery emerged from Renaissance experiments with optics and perspective and went on to serve both scientific and artistic uses in subsequent centuries. By the 18th century, anamorphic visuals entered the realm of popular entertainment and games such as this. The magic mirror was intended for the use and entertainment of children, but Honestly, adults, adults are having a blast with it too. We surely did. <laughs> and it fascinates people of all ages. Um, it essentially blends playful curiosity with science, namely optics. By discovering how the scientific aspect worked, children were basically learning through play. Personally, I feel that the charm of this artifact will never fade. There is always the wow factor when one discovers the undistorted image, whether it is a pre uh, Empress Eugenie or a glutton carrying uh, his belly with a wheelbarrow, as we saw in the previous image. As with any exhibition, we had to include labels and uh, didactics. Their positioning was a challenge in itself because we didn't want to fill the cases with pieces of text. We eventually placed the labels underneath or next to each object, as they should be, but we chose to place the didactics upright, generally in the middle of the case. The result was way more aesthetically pleasing than we anticipated. As I always say, an exhibition must be both aesthetic and functional, which is just like our team over here. <laughs> uh, so that being said, I hope you will visit the library and enjoy the exhibition and uh, please check out the magic mirror. It is indeed an exquisite artifact. Uh, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for attending. I will now pass the mic uh, over to my colleague, Kristen Howard. Hi everyone, thanks so much Octavian. I learned so much working on this exhibition, especially from Octavian who really knows how to put things in the case, where to put them and whether something is aesthetically pleasing or not. And it was really wonderful to get to have that experience. And one thing that was really fun as one of the co-curators putting together the exhibit was we were doing it while students were passing through. And so every now and then we would see students' attention getting grabbed by the objects we had in the case or going into the case. There was one moment where a student had a cup of coffee and Octavia and I were kind of looking and making sure that she wasn't too close to the case, um, which was something I had never considered uh, that you might have to think about uh, while putting together an exhibit. So I really learned a lot and really enjoyed working with the primary source materials, of course. Um, so I am really pleased for the opportunity to speak to you about the third case today, uh, which is the one in the middle, if you see the exhibition in person, and we call it the Wit and Whetstone case. And it consists of riddles for children and adults, other entertaining edifications, visual puzzles, and games intended to exercise the mind. It also includes almanacs, an example of which is pictured right here, um, which are annual publications that provide useful and current information like timetables or the faces of the moon and sun, or we use them for ocean tides uh, where I lived growing up, growing up. In the 19th century, almanacs increasingly included edifying amusements or puzzles as well, like the riddle that we have magnified in the physical display case. Um, and it really stands out from the regular content of instructive and useful information that typified trade almanacs at the time. Now I've chosen a particular item to highlight kind of our overall goal in the case, which is this chat book published around 1790 titled A New Riddle Book or A Whetstone for Dull Wits. It was uh, written and published by John Drury, an enterprising printer, bookseller, and bookbinder, or stationer in short, in Derby, an English city. Now, along with a newspaper that he named after himself, which I think is a little bit of a tongue twister, at least for me, Drury's Derby Mercury, uh, and a number of other books, including poetry, he printed this chapbook of riddles, comical questions, and merry tales. Now, when I was looking at this book, I noticed on the title page that it was printed for the traveling stationers. 
And I was really interested in what this meant. And when I looked into it, I noticed that there are dozens of books and chapbooks during this period that were printed like this one for traveling stationers. Now, I found this to be a bit curious, a bit of a riddle itself, because a stationer is the trade name for all artisans involved in producing books at this time time, including paper makers, illuminators, engravers, binders, as well as those who sold books and paper and writing implements. Now, I wasn't able to find any research on who the traveling stationers are, so I kind of have two ideas about who this group might be. I think it either could be a joke itself, uh, because a printer surely couldn't travel printing um, Presses are very large, very expensive. They're not exactly very mobile. Uh, as the fourth floor at, at, at McGill, we can attest, we have um, a couple of presses there. They're, they're quite large and not easy to transport. Um, so that's kind of one option is that a traveling stationer was a bit of a, of a, bit, of a bit of a joke. Another option is that perhaps it refers to men who sold books by traveling from city to city. Um, perhaps between larger cities like London and other cities like Derby, where this printer was working. But at the time, traveling salesmen were often called something different. They were called drummers, as in a person who drummed up sales, or otherwise bagmen or packmen. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly who the traveling stationers were, but if they did exist, if this wasn't a joke, then I would assume that these people were in desperate need of amusement when traveling from place to place. And perhaps our small humorous chapbook uh, is something that would help amuse them. Um, and it's something that they could easily stow in their pocket and take with them as they traveled. Now, something else I'd like to suggest is that this riddle book is not intended for the edification or use of an individual reading the book, but rather meant to be shared between people between one person reading the book and others, much in the way that some of the food riddles that Natalie just spoke about were intended to be shared, um, such as the satire books, which were rented out specifically to be shared and not necessarily intended for one person. Now, I think this because each page of the chat book has the question of the riddle and the answer on the same page. So you don't really sharpen your own mind with this whetstone by reading the page to yourself. You already can see the answer. And some of the items uh, in the exhibit do in fact have the answers at the back of the book. Um, like I remember from my textbooks in math in high school, for example, we don't wanna show students the answer on the same page. So instead, I imagine that this book is intended to be shared and read aloud. Now, Many of the riddles in this book have very convoluted answers. So for example, one answer to a riddle is a hog fattened with acorns, which makes good bacon. And I think that's a little bit hard to get to, um, but I've chosen one of the more simple ones that I would like to share. Uh, so I do have it typed up so I can post it into the chat, um, but I will go ahead and read it at least at first. So the question is, two brothers we are, great burdens we bear by which we are bitterly pressed. In truth, we may say we are full all the day, but empty when we go to rest. So um, I will copy this over so I can paste it into the chat for everyone. Ah, and we already have someone who's answered it correctly uh, in the chat. So I will read it again in case you aren't looking there at the answer already. Two brothers we are, great burdens we bear, by which we are bitterly pressed. In truth, we may say we are full all the day, but empty when we go to rest. Uh, and the answer is indeed a pair of shoes. Now, just to finish up talking about this chapbook, in addition to the riddles that are in this style with the question and the answer, the book also has several comical questions, um, at least one of which reads to me uh, like word problems in algebra class. Um, if six shillings and a farthing shall be paid by a select number of men, each paying an equal share, how many shall there be? There are some kind of these like uh, word puzzles. Um, and then the chat book also has at the end, merry tales and comical jest, which are intended to amuse and delight. And again, could be read aloud for the enjoyment of many people together. Now, the case also includes a number of items that do seem to be intended for individual consumption rather than for sharing, and particularly for individuals to learn, like the educational texts with illustrations and puzzles that we've called entertaining edifications. 
um, which include not only children's literature, like a book called Amusements in Mathematics, you can see my uh, math theme kind of running through here, but also educational card games, board games, and bingo cards. And uh, Jacqueline, who will be speaking next again, um, is going to talk about the Rebus cards in particular. And um, the case also has riddles intended for older adults um, who may not only find solving riddles to be enjoyable, but also to act as brain teasers to provide not only entertainment, but also exercise for the mind. And I think um, this reminds me of the, the new craze that I will admit that I'm part of, of playing Wordle first thing every morning before I even drink my coffee so that I can, uh, you know, exercise my brain before, you know, looking at my emails and starting my day. Um, so that's everything I have to say about this case uh, before passing it back over to Jacqueline. And again, please do come visit the exhibit in person if you can. It's really wonderful and quite fun, especially if you're a fan of riddles. Thanks, Kristen. I, I'm smiling partly because I too play Wordle and I had a really good streak going and I forgot, just plain old forgot yesterday. So I broke my streak. Um, anyways, uh, what I'm going to tell you a little bit about is the digital component of this exhibition, in addition to one of my favorite things, which, which Kristen mentioned, the, the uh, rebus puzzles. So what I'm going to show you is actually the web version of the digital exhibition that you can explore on a touch table in the lobby. So the Riddle Project, um, which, as Natalie mentioned, had a number of research assistants working on it over the, over the last couple of years, um, they created a interactive website and exhibition that you can see alongside the three physical cases. And to start this off, though, I just do, I am curious, I'm going to launch a poll, you can all weigh in. Before today, had you ever heard of a conundrum supper? And I'll let you filter, filter in the, uh, the results and we'll see. Um, because the remarkable thing to me is the sheer number of conundrum suppers that the team uncovered in the research. So there's an enormous digital data set that accompanies this physical exhibition. And that's what this website explores. So actually results are in, we have no more new answers. I'll share results. Overwhelmingly, perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer is no, you hadn't before today. So Natalie will want to get in touch with those few of you who answered yes. Um, thank you for weighing in. So you've learned a little bit about it today. And what I'll show you here is some of the digital work that the team did. Today, the team, as I said, has discovered over a thousand conundrum suppers and riddling events. And yet, of course, very few people have heard of them as our poll shows. One reason is that, as Natalie laid out, they went by different names throughout history, and often they were hiding in plain sight. You can read a blog about that on the website, but this is the, the landing page. And one of the ways to explore this digital exhibition is through interactive maps. So here they've actually plotted all of these riddling events as points on a map. This one is the interactive map, and it actually allows you to filter by year, by archive, or whether the menu is actually included with the data set. So you can click on any one of these points and you can see more details about what the event was and when it took place. You can filter the map by year using the sliders or show all of the years and all of the events. Um, there is the proviso that this is not all of the data that the team found, but it does, it does um, communicate most of it. You can also filter by which archive the um, riddling event or the riddling menu was found in. So the team did scrape the historical newspaper archives from across the United States, Canada, the UK, and France. And this does um, include most of those results. And this, this was created, it's a GitHub powered website and, and the open source uh, code base that they use for this visualization. You can, if you're interested in that aspect, you can check it out on the GitHub project and we'll send out links. Another way to explore this that's a bit more of a guided tour is through story maps. So the team created a specific narrative to um, see the different ways that the riddles are connected. This story map helps clarify questions about riddle patterns and movement identified over the course of the project. A little bit more of that history that Natalie gave you at the beginning. So you can scroll down and each individual moment zooms into a specific subset of riddles. This is the original <laughs> for us, the Ur text, that Doncaster manuscript 
um, from Hoot and Pagnell Hall, you can see on the map here, north of Doncaster, that is the original one that we purchased here. And from there, you can trace where things moved as you move through the story map. So that's one that you can explore from the comfort of your home, and we will send the links out for that. Um, the story map, as I said, it's a step-by-step -step journey, and every riddle is clickable for further information. There are also interactive charts that plot the riddles by year as opposed to geography. This one shows the distribution by year, um, also by country. So you can uh, play with this as well to see what month was more popular and even what day of the week was more popular. And you can see that there were definitely peaks on the weekends. That's the popular time to host your conundrum supper. So if you're thinking of reviving the tradition, you can do it based in historical data, thanks to the Riddle Project team. There's another story map actually that shows different concentrations. There are peaks in riddling events, as Natalie mentioned, there's a peak of popularity for conundrum suppers that was later than the peak for enigmatic bills of fare or eboffs. There's also one that you can uh, tour through to see which holidays impacted um, the frequency or the themed elements of these riddling events. So that's one way to explore both through geography and through the dates. You can explore the data set um, and the digital work that went into that digital component of the exhibition. The other way that you can explore online is uh, we actually have a digital exhibition of images of some of the physical items that are in the case. And this you can explore uh, at your leisure once again. This is powered by Cortex. Um, and Cortex is powered itself by Adam Matthew, but we used it as a pilot because Cortex offers a handwritten text recognition software powered by an artificial intelligence. So we used the Doncaster Manuscript Collection as a pilot um, to test out this handwritten text transcription functionality. So now the entire manuscript collection has been processed and it is searchable. Um, and you can search it online. They also have an exhibition component, Cortex does. So we built this exhibition testing out that functionality. And if you, like I, have a lot of fun playing with the maps, I also want to see what the objects really look like and the tangible visuals, the pop of color. Um, it's interesting to see the physicality of them. So that's this, this component of the digital exhibition gives you. And it has some of the highlights of the GitHub site, but also some of the highlights of the physical exhibition. So it's a good summary and fusion of the, the physical cases and the uh, digital component. So what I'm gonna do is actually close with one of my favorite things and share once again, a different story. My favorite things, um, as Kristen mentioned, I really do like the Rebus puzzles, a visual puzzle. Um, and not all of, of course, the visual puzzles have the three-dimensional appeal of the anamorphic mirror that Octavian showed. In fact, most are two-dimensional prints. So one of the challenges of the exhibition is how to make a compelling and active, vibrant exhibition out of aged, slightly yellowed parchment and print objects. But visual puzzles are present in the exhibition and they are fascinating to all ages. The rebus is one type of visual puzzle and we have a few examples in the exhibition. It requires you to decode both words and images. Small illustrations replace either words or syllables to encode a message or puzzle. Today, we are all more rebus literate than perhaps in the past, thanks to the use of emojis. So here on screen is a emoji translation of one of the items in the exhibition or a portion of it. And you can put it in the chat if you can uh, figure out what that says. It's, uh, I'll show you the actual item in a moment, but there's a version of it. And here is the version from 1791. Ah, yeah, we've got the beginning of it. As the first of all evils, beware, O oh woman, of the bewitching charm of curiosity. The prying eye is foe to itself and the listening ear and so on and so forth. There's one that I honestly can't figure out and that's this one right here. So if anyone has ideas of what that is, put them in chat. Um, I welcome insight. These puzzles, rebuses in particular, have a history in heraldry. 
with images hinting at the name of the title bearer. Modern rebuses are more common as word plays, sometimes as clues in crossword puzzles or pictograms, replacing syllables with sounds. There was even a television show, a game show in the 60s called The Rebus Game, where contestants had to create rebuses to communicate their answers. In the Victorian era, with the surge in popularity of greeting cards, thanks to cheaper mass printing techniques and an improved postal system, cards in general were much more widely available, and cards like these were also more widely available. Hieroglyphics, too, had caught public imagination after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone in 1799 and the later deciphering of hieroglyphics in the 1820s. These sets, these cards that you see in the exhibition, are actually, they fit well in the Wit and Whetstone case because there's a puzzle to them, but they are also very edifying. They tell you about the perils of certain certain behaviors like curiosity or um, the perils of losing your reputation for young women, the value and virtue of education, the importance of it. And um, today, uh, these are actually quite interesting in the case because it makes you do a double take. There are actually two distinct sets in the case. Um, both are printed and on the left of the screen here, you see one edition and on the right is the other edition. You can see they're identical. They're both printed, but hand, later hand colored. The one on the light on the left uh, is from approximately 1780, and the one on the right you can see is actually dated uh, from 1791 from a London printer, John Wallace, in Ludgate Street. It gives us a very concrete idea of the date of the other set, of course, um, because they are, as you can see, identical. John Wallace was a printer and a publisher of satires, maps, and playing cards in London, and he operated from the 1780s through at least 1814. So it's very possible that these two editions came from the same print shop. Um, he was also an etcher, possibly an etcher himself. So both sets you can see are hand-colored and really an interesting example of, uh, of a rebus puzzle, or as they're called, also a hieroglyphic card. Um, so they do deserve a double take. We invite you and welcome you all to explore the exhibition, either digitally or in person. Our McLennan Library building is open 8 a.m. to midnight, Monday to Friday through April 3rd. And we are open to all of the uh, vaccinated public for the time being, and we hope to welcome everyone in the near future. For all of you who are further away, we do invite you to visit the digital components of the exhibition and to test your wits against some of the riddles and culinary uh, menu is on display there. So now we're going to move on to questions. If any of you have questions for us, for any of the curators, you can put them in the chat um, and we will voice them on your behalf. There was actually some in there I see already as I was speaking. Um, and I think there was one about a TV show called Concentration that revealed rebuses as well. Natalie, does that ring any bells? No, not for me no. either. But maybe members of the audience remember it. I certainly remember the game concentration, but that was a memory game, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe so. There's also the school child concentration version where you had to repeat patterns mm -hmm. from, from the previous. Yeah. Um, I guess I can launch us with a question. Um, for oh, for your project, Natalie, as you've helmed a a roster of research assistants and have, have delved into this rather niche area. Um, how have you found like academic and critical response to your project? Have you found uptake amongst other scholars? Um, it, it's pretty interesting. When we started, we discovered three blog posts in total on enig enigmatic bills of fare. So it was that niche. Um, and then as you did such a fabulous job, actually, of showing off the touch table on the GitHub site. As you've seen, we we found you know multiple hundreds of examples of conundrum suppers and eboffs, and even in this chat, we have a couple of people chatting privately with me and talking about how I heard about conundrum suppers. So it's a um, this is the beginning of a search. We're going to find more and more and more. So there's some different kinds of uptake. We've um, we've pu we've published three articles now. So we've done some scholarly, scholarly publishing. We've also um, written quite a few blog posts on the Library Matters site. So they're open access, they're short, illustrated, you know, readable. Uh, 
But one of the ways we had the most engagement is we actually tried to solve a lot of the riddles because they're hard, they're hard to solve. And so we've, um, we have an Instagram account that's called at riddles in time. We'll share it with you. Um, and also on Twitter, we went on to Twitter and asked our colleagues and friends. Um, and there was some really interesting uptake. There's a, um, there's a very clever, I'm going to call her a Riddler, but you know, there are a couple of people who are just, they have a knack for riddles. There's one in Ireland who's become one of our master Riddlers. There was um, a member of library staff who um, just could, could answer our riddles. You know, if we sent it out to library staff within the hour, she was clearly using her lunch hour and just answering. So there was a lot of uptake from the community as well. So I know I participated. Yeah, it's very much a project that, that involves different people and different people like different kinds of puzzles. So um, you haven't mentioned the Jane Eyre charade yet, Jane Austen charade at the beginning. So a charade, if, for those of you who read Emma, will remember that a charade is a puzzle that gives you um, clues to particular syllables of the word. And then the last clue is to the whole word. So there are a number of people who are excellent at charades, but can't for the life of them fathom a rebus. Um, <laughs> And then there are um, others who, you know, the sort of person who can do a cryptic crossword in the newspaper, but can't do the straight crossword. And, and they are able to get the punning riddles and the riddles that, that need you to see at a different angle. Um, Jacqueline, you're being asked to show the Jane Austen riddle again. Sure. I will copy and paste that back in the chat. Um, where do I have that text? I will find that. But in the meantime, there is a question that came in from, from the crowd about uh, specifically into whether this tradition also existed in French society here. Um, and I think I can partly answer that by once again sharing my screen and looking at the map. Um, but if you want to comment on it, Natalie, I'll, I'll put up what I have here. This is through the interactive exhibition once again. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit more to these blue dots <laughs> that happened that took place here in Quebec. Um, I can, and we can go and actually, you can even click on them. Mm -hmm. um, on the whole, we found that this is an English language phenomena. Um, and I didn't want to put it in the chat because I'm not sure enough to write it down. Um, but when we look for community cookbooks in Canada, it's much, much, much easier to find English language community cookbooks from Protestant denominations, ironically, than it is to find French, French language community cookbooks. We tend to find cookbooks from um, uh, uh, written by um, nuns or who became teachers, especially of the normal schools, but they weren't communi community fundraising books in the same way. Um, so I don't know why this is something that, that we've explored and we've thought about, but generally speaking, the phenomena seems to be in English language, um, even in Quebec. So you're pointing to the townships in those blue dots, and you'll see that a number of them are actually English language. Mm. Um, yeah, you'll also I click on each publication, there's a, it gives you right. which publication it, it, was, it appeared in, so the Sherbrooke Daily Record. That's right. Um, there is a bias um, in terms of being able to scrape the data that it's easier to search English language newspapers because there are um, databases that compile those newspapers. It's actually much harder, harder to search not only um, French language newspapers in Canada, but also in France, where we're doing a project trying to explore the use of the word restaurant in French using Le Figaro and other French language newspapers. And that's, those databases are actually quite hard to navigate. So there's a bias built into the data searching strategy there. Well, thanks for explaining a little more about it. Of course, we invite you all to host your own now based on this resource and let us know how it goes. Um, thank you, Kristen. You have given me the text again. I'll put the Jane Austen charade in the uh, in the chat here, but as Natalie said, there's a specific structure to charades, charades. I'm not exactly sure the pronunciation, I hear both. Um, but the structure of it at the time, it's not the, 
the social game as we know it now, where you have to mime and act out what it is, of course. Um, the first part referred to the first syllable, the second clue refers to the second syllable or the whole, and then you, what you're solving is the whole word. So that's that's the other hint for uh, for the Jane Austen content. There's an entire book in the case, and, and there's a few there's a few on display there. Um, there is another question in the in the chat. Um, one request here for the first speaker, that would be you, Natalie, to be so kind as to share the book title that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm writing a book on a history of menus at the moment, so this is actually a very useful book. It's by Eve Marlowe. Um, and it's based on mostly the, the menus in the British Library collection. And it's called, um, logically, The Menu. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. There's also um, another question about eggs. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the crowd is specifically wondering if you've come across any egg riddles in your, in your research, of course. And for me, one of the things that stands out that you touched on, Octavian, and that, you touched, that all of us did actually, is the shared nature of riddles and the exchanging practice. And for me, one of the fun things is always the sharing of it, because you have that moment of power when you know the answer and the others do not. And that's the moment that the riddles are fun um, and challenging. And so you would collect them. So you'd have this hoard of riddles to share. So you might have a hoard of egg riddles that you're, you're guarding, but I, I wonder if you'd share any, or if you have resources for it that you can point us to. I can send you a number of word riddles. It's quite often it, uh, with egg riddles. Quite often it's to do with um, the treasure of gold is one of the hints. Um, yeah, and it's, I think it, I can it, think of Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, one of the, the exactly. Exes, yeah. exes, he gets the answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen, a question just came in in the chat. Are, did you knit the sweater that you're wearing? <laughs> Yes, I, I just responded. Yes, I, I did. Uh, I can tell that you must have come to some of our previous events with me. <laughs> oh, and uh, yes, dad jokes may be another form of riddle, but maybe for another event, they have a, a nice, um, you, you definitely collect those the same. <laughs> and somebody recognized the cushion in the, in the in frame. So we're coming to the end of our time here. I'm gonna say an enormous thank you to all of you in the crowd who came and uh, who are interested in the exhibition and to all of you presenters. I'm gonna add a spotlight. So Octavian and Chris will put you all on screen um, and say an enormous thank you to you for the work that went into the exhibition and also for shedding a light on what goes behind the scenes, sharing some of the riddles and sharing the community and social practice of riddles with us today. Um, thank you, Octavian. Thank you also to Labiba behind the scenes for helping make sure this goes smoothly. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction and for that original purchase. And Natalie, go ahead. Um, it's to keep you here because oh. you you gave the Jane Austen riddle, but and you know the answer, but you didn't give it. Yes, I'm teasing everyone. Apologies. The answer that we learned, that we came to was agent or agent. So my first is divided in public i am a gentleman in public deeds and words united i am a monster that that gentleman devoured and that's a little harder to to rationalize but agent seems to be the the consensus answer so yes if you want to continue reading and learning about the riddles project we will send out a follow-up with all of the links that you can explore for yourself or we invite you to come and visit in person masked and vaccinated for the time being, and we hope to welcome everyone in the near future. So thank you again. And Lovely to see everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>